So Jordan, you know I love you and we both have kids. I just think that XT4 dad joke was abysmal. Oh, it's not an XT4, it's XTC. I'm gonna try to outdo ya. We're doing the Panasonic G100 today, but it's more like G Fun 100. Welcome back to EPRV TV viewers. Chris Nichols here, and we have a brand new launch. We have a pre-production G100 from Panasonic, a hybrid camera which is largely targeting vloggers. Now, this is the second sort of targeted vlogger camera in as many months that we've taken a look at, because of course we did just do a video on the Sony ZV-1. But this does something very different. We've got a larger sensor here and interchangeable lenses, and the ZV-1 did have some compromises which we felt kept it from being the world's best vlogging camera. Is this the world's best vlogging camera? We're gonna find out. Now at first glance, when you take a look at the new G100, it is very compact, very small, and that's further uh, complemented with the 12 to 32 kit lens, a lens that we've looked at before we actually really enjoy, not only for its optical performance, but its very compact nature. But in order to make a camera this small, there are some compromises. First off, there's no IBIS system for this sensor. That's gonna be a big downside. And we do have to go to a smaller battery. Battery life on this camera, although this is still pre-production, isn't stellar. However, you can still charge this camera off a USB port. Some of that loss of battery life might be the fact that we have very powerful screen displays on this camera. First off, for vlogging, we have a beautiful fully articulating touchscreen, three inches, 1.84 million dots, so it's very high resolution. Uh, and for the EVF, 3.68 million dots. It's quite beautiful, decent magnification too. Now, at first thought, I was thinking, well, for vlogging, what's the point of having such a nice EVF? We're not going to use it. But then you start to think, well, maybe this isn't specifically a vlogging camera. As a, you know, do everything jack of all trades camera, we actually have exceptional displays for this camera at this price point. So, as a hybrid camera, let's talk about the ergonomics for photography. Uh, first off, we have four customizable function buttons. That's not bad for a simple camera, but we don't have a button on the back to do auto focusing with. That's a big downside for me personally, but a lot of people might not care. This camera does have dual control dials. I'm not pushing any buttons I don't want to, so it looks cheap, but it actually works quite well. Unlike the ZV-1, I do like that we have good clearance on the tripod adapter here at the bottom as well. If I'm using a selfie stick or a smaller tripod plate, I'm still going to be able to get to my card and my batteries very easily. Now for ergonomics that people are going to like for video, first off the camera is very lightweight and the grip actually is comfortable whether you're holding it you know, for photography front ways or holding it towards you uh, for videography. But we do have this little selfie stick option that you can buy. The plastic tripod seems a little bit chintzy but it works and this thing is very affordable as an add-on if you do buy the kit. Now it does plug in through the USB port and I do want to mention this is a USB 2.0 port. Unfortunately what that means is that there's not going to be any sort of real option for USB-C headphones phone support or anything like that. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. Now the Panasonic G100 is using a proprietary new system. It's called the Ozo Audio System. It's made by Nokia. You may not know who that is, but as a middle-aged man myself, it's very comforting to know that they're still making products. I'm amazed. And what this is basically doing is using multiple microphones around the camera that are able to point in different directions. Now the cool thing about this is, whether you're in front of the camera or behind the camera or side of the camera, it should be able to automatically detect you and then use the right microphones for the right situation. But you can also set it yourself. You can set it so that all the microphones pick up omnidirectionally around the entire camera so you'll get a cacophony of sound all around you or you can force it to just go forward, just go back or to intelligently track something in front of the camera and aim the microphones for that. So this should give us very good audio control. It should also be able to minimize when you have sounds around you that you don't want getting picked up. Hopefully it sounds good when Jordan does his part. Okay, so this is designed as a vlogging camera, so I guess that means I, Jordan, get to do a little bit of vlogging with it. And right now I'm starting in the 1080-24 mode, and we're testing quite a few things. I'm using the built-in microphone right now, as well we're using the standard stabilization mode right now. And there's a very small crop. We've got about a 26 millimeter equivalent instead of 24. However, there's also a high mode that should be a little more stable. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so now we're in the stabilization mode high, and you can see it crops again. This is really as tight a frame as I would want for vlogging, but it is a little bit more stable once we jump over here. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is this has a new vlogging selfie mode. When you flip the screen right towards you, it switches into face and eye detect, which is tracking me right now. As well, it switches to its tracking audio, where it's just going to listen to what's in front of the camera. So if Chris were to, you know, be grumbling and complaining yeah, as like he does. Yeah, all the mosquitoes that are biting me right now, or the fact that I'm 
carrying all the gear. Then you can hear, it really does a nice job of kind of eliminating that audio from it, focusing on what's important and in front of the lens, important subject right here. Uh, and I do quite like that. However, there's also an auto option, and we're gonna take a look at that next. So we're using the auto mode, which as you would expect, automatically will choose which microphones it thinks it should use to record the subject. So as I walk over closer to the camera on this side, it should be adjusting the microphone so my audio level stays generally the same. And I could even go walk all the way around the camera. I don't know what the autofocus is didn't do right now, but I'm sure it's not gonna be pretty. And you can hear my audio levels stay pretty much the same all the way around. It really does a good job of isolating what it thinks is the audio it should be recording. Okay, so now we've switched to surround sound mode. So you should be able to hear me talking, uh, commenting on Chris's gross wet butt. Chris, yep. why is your butt gross and yep. wet? I fell in a lake, Jordan. It was great. I fell in a lake, and I'm carrying all the stuff, and you said the Deep Review TV was going to be an endless thrill ride. And I'm not having very much fun today. Now we've switched over to 4K mode, because 1080 is obviously child's play. And there is an additional crop. So now we're in 4K with standard stabilization on it. You can see it's a very tight frame. It's a good thing that I have long arms and a proportional head. I mean, we had to put Chris way in the background so his giant head would still fit in the frame here. Now, once we go this tight, we're past 30 millimeters, so we're really not in wide-angle country anymore. As well, because we've got that tighter frame, it's much more demanding on the image stabilization. You can see here, it is really quite bouncy. Okay, so here we are on stabilization mode high, and we're getting pretty close to a normal lens at this point. I'm, it's basically unusable for vlogging at this point. You'd really just want to flip the camera around or put it on, I don't know, like a six foot monopod pole or something like that. But for something designed to be a vlog camera, if you want 4K recording and good image stabilization, you're not gonna get that combination at a usable focal length. Okay, so now we're shooting in 4K with active stabilization on, but one of the big advantages of this over the Sony ZV-1 is it takes interchangeable lenses. So we can just swap out this beautiful Panasonic Leica 8 to 18 millimeter. I love this lens. The only drawback is using it more than doubles the price of this setup and certainly makes it a lot more bulky as well. Even at eight millimeters, we're still getting pretty close to a 30 millimeter equivalent with 4K and active image stabilization which is usable, but again, very close to the edge of what I'd consider an acceptable focal length for vlogging. So sound was clearly a big priority for Panasonic since they put in the Ozo surround system in it. And I do like that there's still a mic jack on this, but there is no way to monitor audio. And I know the argument is always, look, no vlogger is gonna wanna be wearing headphones while they're recording. That may be true, but they certainly might want to plug some on and make sure the audio is okay after they record a clip or to set their levels beforehand, and you don't have that option. No headphone jack, and the USB port on this doesn't allow you to use headphone adapters for it. When I saw this body, one thing that kind of jumped out to me is, well, it's a larger body than the Sony, so it should be very good for long record times, but the battery life is quite short on it. And more egregiously, this actually has a 10 minute 4K record limit cutoff. So if you're gonna do long pieces to camera, you wanna ramble on and on, just not really get to the point very quickly, really take your time to get to the end of your thought, you're gonna find that this camera's record limit is gonna be a real problem for you. Okay, so now we're recording on Panasonic's Vlog L profile, not their full Vlog. Uh, and here you can see it ungraded, and here's what it looks like when you apply a grade to it. This is a super weird decision because this is an 8-bit camera, so it can be quite difficult to work with log files when you're doing that. And a lot of the more easy-to-use, more 8-bit friendly profiles like Panasonic's beautiful Leica 709 profile or their new flat profile aren't available in this camera. So you've got the option of either very punchy or honestly slightly outdated profiles like the Cine Like D or the super flat Vlog L where you might have a lot of issues with banding in the image. I don't know guys. <laughs> okay, I've done everything that I said I would do today. I vlogged, I can't say I enjoyed the process. If you have any suggestions for how I cannot feel like a huge a while I'm vlogging, please post them in the comments below. But for right now, I'm gonna go bring this home and take a look at the footage. You're supposed to walk off to the frame, Jordan. Oh. Huge Okay, so after testing this for a little while, let's take a look at how the image quality actually is. And bear in mind that this is still with pre-production firmware on the camera. But I will say that the 1080p quality on this camera is quite good, and this has always been one of Panasonic's real strong suits. And it means that the slow-mo recording, which goes up to 120 frames per second, is also quite nice. 
Now, unfortunately, when we switch over to 4K, there we see some real drawbacks. Now, it's just using a 4K area of the sensor, and what that means is once you start putting that electronic image stabilization on, it's not actually capturing a 4K image. It's capturing lower resolution and up it. And we do definitely see a very soft image, especially when we put the stabilizer on high, as well as having that very difficult crop to work with. I would certainly say that the Sony RX100, which actually super samples a lot of the extra resolution in its sensor, gives you much better results. Even without a crop applied, it's a sharper image. Once you start putting the digital stabilization on it, then it is head and shoulders better than the Panasonic version. So now let's talk about autofocus. And this is not stills autofocus. I actually find the Panasonic DFD system very good for single point stills autofocus. But in video, it's got a pretty notorious reputation for hunting. And unfortunately, that is still definitely the case with this. Now they do have a new algorithm that kicks in when you flip the screen around. So you're in its vlogging mode, detects faces and eyes, does its best to track it. But when I was out shooting that vlogging footage, I would say maybe half of my footage was actually in focus. And you can really see very very distracting wandering of the focus back and forth, especially in some of the 4K footage, which looks even more jarring because it's sharper. Now, bear in mind, again, this is pre-production firmware, so we'll have to see if this shapes up in the future, but for the time being, I mean, the Sony ZV-1 is just a much more compelling camera if you need very good consistent autofocus. Now looking at the image stabilization, it's a lot like the video quality that I talked about. In 1080p recording, where it can use five axis stabilization, the results are fairly good, especially when you pair it with the 12 to 32 lens. Now that has optical stabilization in it, so that's working together with the electronic image stabilization system. Once we switched over to 4K, I definitely saw a degradation, and you can see some weird wobbling around the edges of the frame. Now that's largely because it's only using four axes. There's actually no correction for roll when you're in 4K recording. Now as well, when I switched over to the 8 to 18, which is a very wide field of view, should actually minimize a little bit of the jitters when we're switching over there. Because there's no optical stabilization in that lens, I found that the results were really poor. Uh, I think you definitely need to use this camera with a lens that's optically stabilized because this was just bouncy and, in my opinion, basically unwatchable. The other thing I really wanted to talk about is the audio on this. Now, I do think that the Ozo technology is actually pretty cool, did a nice job keeping the audio levels the same as I moved around the camera. And when you're looking right at the camera, does a nice job of isolating so that there's just the speaker's voice recorded as strongly as possible. The downside is the actual pickups on those microphones. It is quite tinny, not a lot of low end to it. Okay, I've done everything that I said I would do today. I vlogged, I can't say I enjoyed the process. So for recording here, I just wound up plugging a inexpensive lav mic back into the camera and I'm far happier with the audio with this. So unfortunately, that Ozo audio is the main thing that sets this apart from the other Panasonic cameras in the line, and a lot of the other new features I'm not very impressed with. Then we have the Sony ZV-1, which is a much smaller package that's giving you very usable autofocus, and the lens is far faster. Now, it does have a smaller sensor, but I still found that the Sony gave you a sharper, better image when recording 4K. So unless you need a vlog camera, you don't plan to add a microphone to it, and you're only going to be shooting 1080, it's really tough to find an audience for the G100. So what we're struggling with is trying to find an audience for the G100 because it's trying to do too many things at once. There's lots of compromises and it doesn't end up doing anything particularly well. If we look at the vlogging and video aspect, we're still stuck at 8-bit video. Uh, you know, the crop is too heavy for vlogging without buying really expensive lenses. The autofocus and stabilizer didn't really blow us away. And so I think there's a lot better competition out there that can vlog or a lot of other cameras that aren't meant for vlogging that basically do the same job. When we look at photographic purposes, well, it is very compact, absolutely. We'll give it that. And it has a nice time-lapse feature because it's using the same time lapses that we really like on the G9 and, you know, the G95. I can't help but feel like we're paying for microphones, we're, we're paying for high-end displays, but we're not getting a lot of meat where we need it. Maybe when this camera comes down in the future in price, it might find a more appealing market. As it is right now, I'd probably spend a few hundred dollars more and really take a solid look at the Panasonic G9. That is a true hybrid camera. It's large, but it's incredibly capable photographically, incredibly capable in the video world with all the updates it's had, and so you might find that a more appealing all-around camera. 
camera. Anyways, I hope you guys have found this useful. Maybe the G100 does fit in that niche for you. Let us know what you think below in the comments. Please check out our Instagram and our Twitter feeds. Go to deepyearview.com. We'll have a sample gallery up there for you. Thanks so much for joining us.